Hi there, I'm Jacob uh, and welcome to the first in a new series of Hacksock Talks for this year. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, robotics and more specifically mapping in robotics uh, because robotics itself is of course a very large area to talk about. So uh, I guess I'll get started with um, uh, why, who am I? Why do I think I don't talk about this? So I'm uh, in my final year here now uh, at York uh, and I'm mostly done stuff in embedded systems but uh, there's some overlap there with robotics and I ended up doing my third year project in robotics and had some mapping component to it so I feel at least somewhat qualified to talk about this. So I guess I'll start off with quite a simple uh, point which is um, what is robotics and what is mapping in relation to robotics? So um, robotics is well all about robots. Here's a little robot. This is um, a PyPug. Um, they're a robot platform that's developed here at the University of York. Um, fundamentally they're an EPUG which is a little robot with some wheels and it's got a Raspberry Pi stick on top of it. Um, not much more complex than that but um, they're a good base uh, to talk about this with mainly because I'm familiar with them so this little guy will be coming up quite a bit throughout the talk. So, um, robots, they move around, um, they interact with an environment, uh, and they sometimes build maps of it. So I guess the quest first question that comes up here is, um, why? Uh, so uh, a good uh, motivating example of this is to have a look at something as uh, relatively simple as a robot vacuum cleaner. So we have our little robot vacuum cleaner, which is probably small and round and buck shaped roughly, but probably a bit bigger than this one. Uh, and that robot vacuum cleaner is going to move around the environment uh, and it's going to clean. Um, but while doing this, it can't just move semi-randomly, or randomly in fact. If it did move around the environment randomly, yes, that would work. It would um, probably eventually get to everywhere, uh, but it fundamentally has a few issues then. Uh, so one of the main issues you'd have there is that um, well you wouldn't know where you'd come from where your charging station was as a robot so clearly some understanding of the environment and some ability to find where you are in it is important uh, and uh, well uh, as you'll probably uh, can guess uh, just being able to do something like keep track of where you have been and uh, retrace your steps uh, it's usually not enough, um, so an actual understanding of the environment is important. So I guess I'll go on to uh, have a look at this from uh, an analogy. Let's imagine we are, instead of um, our little puck robot or whatever, let's imagine we're a human, um, which you probably are. So uh, you are in a room. You can look around you, you can see the walls of the room, um, all the different things in the room. Uh, and these uh, can be abstractly described as obstacles. They are uh, impassable terrain, um, or at least they are for a little robot friend, so they will be for humans as well for the purposes of this. Um, so we can have a look around our environment using our eyes, uh, and we can see what things we can and can't uh, go through roughly, we can identify what's probably an obstacle, and we can build up our own little mental map. And this all happens um, without us even really realizing it most of the time. So that happens in the background, uh, and what we're doing there really is, though, building a map of our environment. Um, another important thing is that if I move uh, to one side, or if I move forwards a bit, uh, I now have a different map of the environment. My map has changed to some degree. The distance to the points in the room that I was looking at previously have changed. So now I have a different map of the environment, but crucially, I can still relate that back to the map I had previously. I know where I am now. I know where I was then. And I don't just know this. Well, at a high level, I know this because I can compare the two maps, but I do also know this for other reasons, which we'll get into later. So this brings us to one of the core 
co-concept really to mapping. I I created the map of the environment, but I also localized myself within the environment. I could tell where I was and where I had been, uh, which is important uh, if we want to be able to find our way back somewhere. We need to know where we are, as well as being able to tell what our environment is like. So, um, that's kind of our analogy that we'll be using throughout this. We are uh, comparing the way robots move to the way humans move, and there's a lot of disparity there, but for the purposes of comparison, uh, it works. So, uh, let's look at, first of all, what a robot map actually looks like at all, to begin with. Um, so, you should now be able to see, uh, if I have edited this correctly, which I'm sure I have, uh, a uh, picture of a pretty blocky map of an environment. Uh, this is uh, a map that was actually created uh, using um, PyPux uh, to map uh, an environment constructed in my uh, parents' front room. So um, the lockdown definitely affected my project a tiny bit, at least. It was not as polished an environment as I would have wanted to map, but I'm sure you can appreciate that it's still basically the same thing. So we have this map of our environment, and you can see that there are blocks around it effectively showing us uh, what is impassable, um, or at least where there is an obstacle as far as we can tell. Um, this is sometimes referred to as an occupancy map. Um, so we can see what area of our map is occupied and what area is not. Now, one of the things you may be able to notice from this is that it's actually pretty granular. Um, you can see each individual section either like maybe one by one centimeter or less or more than that, which has been categorized as containing an obstacle or not containing an obstacle. So this kind of map is a simple map, but is for the majority of tasks all that is really required. and even just a 2D map is usually sufficient for the majority of tasks. Um, say we've got our robot vacuum cleaner and it needs to get around the house and find its way back. That vacuum cleaner is not going to be going up and down the stairs, at least not yet. Um, so it doesn't need to have any understanding of the third dimension. Either it can get somewhere or it can't get somewhere. So looking at this map, we can see that there are clearly some occupied spaces and some unoccupied spaces. So what makes um, these spaces marked as this for the purposes of this map? What makes spaces occupied or not occupied? Well, there's a number of sensors here and all of them we can talk analogously uh, about by comparing them to our eyes. Um, in that uh, we use our stereoscopic vision to be able to estimate the distance to different things. And there are a number of different methods that robots can use to do a similar task. In fact, one of them is stereoscopic cameras. So just like our eyes, using the difference between two cameras at uh, different locations to be able to estimate uh, distances. This, however, is quite computationally intensive and there are dedicated sensors that can perform this task uh, more efficiently. So um, for instance, let's look at um, a pipe buck. Um, it has distance sensors around the outside. These are estimating distance based upon the amount of reflected light, reflected infrared light. And it also has expansion slots which can be used by uh, time of flight sensors, which will send out pulses of light and then estimate the amount of time, uh, the amount of distance based upon how long it takes for that pulse to get back. Now, this is quite interesting because um, this is actually not very good data for mapping because it's sparse data. Um, we can see there's quite a large distance, about 25 to 30 degrees on average, between each of these readings, uh, which means that there's not a um, consistency, there's not, not a, there'd be gaps in our data, sparse data. So um, what works better than this is big like very heavy cameras or more comparatively LiDAR, um, which is uh, at its core, um, a similar concept to the time of flight sensors, but applied um, on a rotating reference frame. It's, we 
somehow scan across an environment making lots of measurements. Uh, classically, this could just be you're spinning some sensor, um, which is sending out pulses of light and they're coming back. Uh, and that allows you to gather uh, information from lots of points around the rotation. Now, um, this can hopefully give you more dense data, um, that is data that's uh, between maybe 25 degrees, every 2.5 degrees. Uh, that would give you much better information about your environment because then you've got more distance estimates. Now, this doesn't have to be across the full range of view, this could just be across the 180 degrees in front of it um, or similar. Uh, and again, this is comparable to human sight. There is differences here in that um, with uh, distance sensors and things like LiDAR, um, some of them are 3D, some of them are 2D. So for some of them you only see, uh, well, 1D or, or rather, you only see distance in one dimension out, in, out around. Uh, in others, you also can see up and down a bit. Um, so you kind of get a spherical view. Um, but uh, either way, you are getting information uh, that is less, uh, there's less information in there as well than with cameras because you don't get color and stuff like that. But again, it does tell you the important part, which is where your obstacles are. And this allows you to build up an occupancy map or a, an obstacle map, we call it. So where we can see where there are impassable pieces of terrain around the place and where there are gaps in that uh, based upon where we don't get light coming back or don't get positive light um, or where it's just sufficiently weak that we think probably that's nothing there. So now this does bring us back to the question of sure we have this map, we've constructed this map, maybe we've even constructed a map ahead of time just by hand, but we have this map of the environment how do we tell where we are in that environment? Because if we're constructing the map in real time, sure, that allows us to see where obstacles are in relation to us so we can avoid them to some degree. But it importantly doesn't tell us um, where we want to go. It doesn't tell us where we are in an environment. It doesn't let us get to a particular location. Our little robot vacuum cleaner can't get back to its charging station still or can't make sure that it's cleaned all of the house. So, um, we need to be able to perform something called localization, which I touched on earlier. Now, um, at its core, uh, the most uh, basic kind of this localization that you could think of is by taking our current map and comparing it to our, uh, our big map or the map we've generated so far, we can see where it lines up and we can use that to estimate where we are in the entire map. This is reasonably good as long as you have dense uh, data, um, but it does have its flaws. Specifically, it's really hard to get accurate because you have the compounded inaccuracies of the fitting and all of your sensor information. Um, so this is usually used for large drift corrections. Um, it also takes quite a lot of time to be able to um, estimate your position. It takes a lot of processing power, relatively speaking. So this is um, used for typically what's called global localization. Um, so you can tell where you are in the global environment. Um, you can pinpoint your location and it's relatively accurate, but only to a point you were in the past uh, because of the speed of it. So this can correct for drift uh, in the environment. Um, but we need some other source of data typically if we want to be able to track where we actually are in the environment to a higher degree and have a much quicker feedback as to our movement. So if we look at the pipe work again for an example, there are primarily two different ways it can do this. So the simple way is its motors are stepper motors. Uh, that means that they move in steps and we know how long that step is, how many degrees that step is, and we know based upon the size of the wheel how many degrees translates to what movement forward or to the side or whatever. So this allows us to estimate our movement based upon uh, the turning of the wheels because the steps are pretty accurate. Uh, and as a whole this works pretty well. It has its flaws. Uh, one of the biggest ones being if I I'm using that and I pick up the robot, 
well, the wheels are continue to, going to continue to turn, which means that the robot will continue to think it's moving forwards, which it's not because I'm holding it in the air. So um, it can be fooled by if it gets stuck on anything um, or anything like that. Basically, at that point, we're only using what we th how we think we're moving to estimate, which is fine and pretty good, all things considered, but still not that accurate, particularly if you're in an environment where your movement speed can vary, or if you have a robot that doesn't use stepper motors, um, or like you're a human, like me, uh, who definitely doesn't have stepper motors. Um, humans can, to some degree, estimate their movement um, based upon how they've moved their muscles, etc., and how they can feel they've moved, um, but that's not the only thing we want to use. Uh, so, uh, just like that, uh, robots like the Pybook have another sensor that can do this, or another series of sensors, uh, called the IMU, or the Inertial Measurement Unit. This allows us to be actually be able to tell things like our acceleration and our orientation, and in fact, even the magnetic field of the Earth. Um, but we can combine this together to determine um, how the robot is moving through space. We can maybe integrate over acceleration, and we can tell how um, the past acceleration has affected our location. So given the acceleration at this point, how fast were we moving, where would we be in relation to where we started, that kind of thing. Uh, and if we can do this fast enough, this can be immensely accurate. Uh, and now when I say fast enough, I'm not talking tens of times per second, I'm talking hundreds of times per second. Uh, you ideally want to be going at least 256 times per second for most IMUs, uh, which is very, very fast. Um, but if you can do the maths, um, if you can perform the filters necessary on data to be able to tell how you've moved uh, during that time, um, yeah, it's sufficient um, and in fact very good for sensing uh, how you've moved. Uh, and that can perform the more local localization, like with the uh, stepper motors. Uh, so now we can tell where we are in an environment effectively. And again, you can comp compare this to a uh, human. Um, we can tell where our limbs are, where we've tried to move. We can tell um, which way up we are from our uh, vestibular system in our ears, that kind of thing. We can tell roughly what speed we're moving at from a number of input sources. Uh, and we can use all of this to estimate where we'll be. And in fact, our body does estimate where we are all the time. We're seeing the world as it was in the past, um, just as a robot is processing what has happened. Um, and so we have to estimate where we are. Um, now, it's a bit harder for the robot um, because it, we have to actually, well, it's a bit harder for us with the robot because we've actually got to think of how it's supposed to do it. Whereas though, for most people, it just happens. Um, but yes, so um, we now have our mobile, it can now move through the environment. In fact, if we can do both of these things at the same time, if we can map the environment uh, and know where we are within that environment, we are simultaneously localizing ourselves and mapping, or we're doing SLAM, as it's called. There's a phrase that gets thrown around a lot, but it just means simultaneous localization and mapping, uh, which is what we're now doing. So now that we've seen mapping in a more abstract light, um, we've seen uh, the localization, roughly what kind of uh, things are used for that, uh, it might seem like it's pretty simple task to do. We just look at our environment and we see where our obstacles are. Well, to some degree this is true, and to another degree it's a bit more complicated than that to say the least. So um, one of the biggest limitations for uh, mapping is um, the, well, mapping and localization is the data that we get in. So if we look at a practical example, such as the PyPuck, uh, on one hand, it may look like we have quite a bit of data available to us. We have eight distance sensors on the bottom, six distance sensors on the top. That's a lot of distance sensors. That's a lot of data but it's actually a relatively limited amount of data compared to most robotics platforms. Uh, so our eight distance sensors around the bottom uh, are all short range, so tens of centimeters maximum, uh, and um, really quite inaccurate beyond about 20 centimeters. 
So um, they don't help us most of the time. And even if they did, there's a good oof, 20 degrees at least between each one most of the time. They have a bit of an uneven distribution towards the front. They're good for obstacle avoidance, but they're not amazing for mapping. Because we have to get very close to things, amongst other things. Uh, so, um, alternatively, uh, we can try using the, um, the distance sensors on top, the optional distance sensors. These are, as I mentioned previously, time of flight sensors. Um, they're quite accurate. But the problem is, uh, even though they're accurate even above a meter, they suffer from issues caused by the fact that A, they're only individual sensors, and B, they um, are actually measuring the cone of light because the light diffuses as it goes out. So we don't have something as accurate as um, a single pinpoint, and we also don't um, have a lot of data, honestly, because we only have three on each side of the robot, uh, and there's, you know, overall more than 30 degrees between each on average. So we don't actually have that denser data. We don't have that 2.5 degrees or similar that I mentioned earlier, which is kind of a, uh, a minimum for dense data a lot of the time. So um, we have to resort to other methods, basically, because nothing, uh, none of the methods that most people have come up with for mapping can deal well with this sparser data. Um, maybe they can map with it, but they definitely can't localize in that, and they can't uh, really build up the trust in the environment that's required to perform that kind of mapping, because um, you know the slightest change in angle can change what result you're getting from the sensors, which is not what you expect, really. Um, so. The alternative to this, or rather extension of this, the one that I used in the end was to um, the simplistic one, which is just to interpolate between the sensors and create a virtual laser scan from that, or a virtual LiDAR scan, uh, either way. Uh, and that works, relatively speaking, you know, uh, it makes things happy, but um, it does make things like localization very difficult because you don't have an accurate map. Um, and rather, you're, you're, you're individual snapshots that you're trying to localize with are not that accurate. You can build up an accurate map over time, but your global localization is not particularly good, uh, only your well, local localization, because you've still got accurate stepper motors, etc. So you can still get that down. So this is kind of one end of the spectrum. At the other end, there are yes, robots with LiDAR and the like, which are much better at doing this kind of thing. Uh, and can you know localize themselves much more easily than the little piper can can map the environment a lot more easily. But a lot of the interesting uh, research, at least in my opinion, actually is on the uh, is in the area of sparse data. For instance, other people have come up with different solutions to the problem of sparse data. For instance, the piper has a camera on the front, and quite a lot of robots do. This isn't stereoscopic. Uh, vision, we can't see distance using it, but we can estimate distance based upon the image it brings back. Um, we can use, there are a number of different models that have been developed, One, of, lots of the more recent ones are neural network based, but there are some classical models as well. Uh, and by estimating distance using it, we can get some more information. We still have a problem there in that all of that's just an estimation, but there's been some really interesting research into combining this with the sparse distance data that's returned by the sensors uh, to produce more accurate uh, information. Uh, and that could be a really interesting way going forward that we can um, uh, get around the problem of, well, relatively speaking, cameras and distance sensors aren't that expensive, but LiDAR still, to some degree, is, uh, though getting cheaper all the time, as with most of these things. Um, Apart from that, there's also um, completely alternative approaches, like um, entirely move changing the way the robot moves even. Uh, so how it will move through the environment, and maybe it will pause, and then it will rotate round slowly. And there it's effectively doing the same thing we talked about was with LiDAR, in the, like it is trying to change where it's doing each of its measurements. So you imagine you're spinning, you're spinning LiDAR or whatever, um, but instead you're just spinning the robot which does also work. Um, 
So there are a number of different solutions and there's some interesting research out there, but really it is still a relatively unexplored area because a lot of the time people focus on uh, the robots which have all of the cool tech on them, all of the LiDAR, etc. And not so much the robots that are more affordable and have a lot less sensors available to them. So I think what you'll probably see in the future with things like this is probably is going to be a move towards just miniaturizing things like LiDAR, putting them in things and making them cheaper because in the end they produce much better results with a lot less effort. But um, you might not see uh, entirely that. My hope is that you get some interesting uh, research into the alternatives, but um, as with all technology, uh, sometimes the simple but expensive way becomes cheaper uh, a lot, and then people just adapt to that. Apart from that, um, like mapping and um, localization is kind of one of those interesting areas where we have a lot of methods for it. Um, and we can definitely do it, but there's still a lot more uh, optimization to be done on that. Uh, we're still in a world where um, you can just have random glitches and it thinks it's somewhere else. You know, you can work around this a bit, but, um, you know, put in features to make this less likely. But at the end of the day, we are still estimating position and there's still a lot more work to do, uh, particularly, I think as I've hinted at, I just said, several times now with different sensors, with sparse sensors, with dense sensors, of different varieties. Uh, and I have no idea what going forward uh, this kind of thing is going to look like really because, you know, there are so many different methods um, and really this kind of technology is um, being adopted elsewhere now for different tasks. Um, in, uh, in VR, uh, a big thing now is being able to localize a person within a space and in relation to things like their controllers. How do you do this? Well, you use similar um, approaches to localization or maybe entirely different ones. Um, you know, uh, what I haven't talked about here is there is an entire area of localization which is uh, dedicated to localization within, an, uh, within a fixed space where you have fixed markers or similar which allow you to localize in a space. That simplifies a lot of things, um, but is less movable you know you have to be in a space you have to have that space be adapted to the robots instead of the robot adapting to the space which um, nowadays is uh, cheaper and uh, easier to use and will give you more accurate results so for things like vr that makes sense you put a few things in your room and then you can now uh, localize in that space a lot more accurately for robots that's still only makes sense in certain environments. Maybe it makes sense in industrial environments, but it still doesn't really make sense uh, practically for something like our robot vacuum cleaner we were talking about previously. Um, yeah, so I hope I've given a hint as to um, what localization and mapping are in the relation to robots, but also uh, that they are relatively complex. Um, there's a lot more maths and complexity behind all of it than I've really touched on today, but that's understandable given the format. Um, I don't want this to be a maths lecture. There's a lot of maths involved in this, uh, and I will include in the references to this lots of links to learn more about the specific parts of this and specific um, algorithms and things like that that are used in uh, localization and mapping with robots. Um, there's some, in particular, there's some mathematical filters and things like that, which are very commonly used. Uh, so yeah, uh, I hope I've managed to give an overview of um, all of that, uh, and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions about uh, all of this, um, mapping, uh, robotics, uh, or talking more specifically about things like uh, the PyPuck, um, I have a few of them uh, with me, uh, which, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions like that in uh, Discord after this, which I believe there'll be a link to uh, in the description. Um, yeah, that's about it from me. Uh, thanks to everyone for uh, listening to me waffle on for uh, what's probably approaching half an hour at this point. Uh, I may have to edit myself down. I may already have done so. 
Uh, so um, yeah, uh, I'll also oh I'll also link to uh, my um, third year project if anyone's interested in seeing that. Uh, but yeah, that's it from me. Um, thanks very much for watching.